This video is brought to you by Raycon True Wireless Earbuds. Stick around to hear more about them and also a special offer they're making available through my channel. This week in video games... Really sucked. Let's be real. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm aware that we tune into this week in video games for the news, yes. But also to crack a smile here and there, hopefully. Usually it's daily as expense. This week, it's difficult to take the typical jocular tone when so many people who make the games we love are suffering, and when the companies that make those games are being absolute fuckwits. As I'm sure you're aware at this point, Activision Blizzard has been at the center of a firestorm stemming from a lawsuit brought by the state of California after a two-year investigation into Blizzard's alleged culture of discrimination, harassment, and worse. I will pause here and say the contents of this lawsuit are pretty real, and if you'd prefer not to hear the details, you can skip ahead to the time on screen. The state of California's suit, brought on behalf of a number of victims, alleges that Blizzard has long sustained a toxic bro culture, where men are advanced in their careers while more deserving women are left behind, an issue particularly affecting women of color. The suit alleges that women would have to pick up the slack for men who spent most of their days playing video games instead of working, and one story of a woman who was told she couldn't get a promotion because she might get pregnant and like being a mum too much. Beyond the systemic imbalances, there are also allegations of straight-up harassment. One story alleges that male Blizzard staff would engage in what are called cube crawls, where men would get horrendously drunk in the office and then crawl from cubicle to cubicle, harassing women as they went. The most alarming allegation related to a woman who took her own life while on a company trip with her male supervisor. She had been subjected to intense sexual harassment prior to her death, including the sharing of nude pictures at a company holiday party, says the complaint. There's a lot more stuff in here, a lot, and all of it paints a gruesome picture of a company culture that was unfair, unequal, hostile, and ultimately dangerous. Blizzard's response to this has been catastrophically bad, immediately flushing any of the benefit of the doubt people might have extended straight down the toilet. Their first response, provided provided via spokesperson to Jason Schrei of Bloomberg was flat out denials, calling all the allegations, quote, distorted and in many cases false, end quote, and even went as so far as to directly attack the Californian agency bringing the suit, quote, it is this type of irresponsible behavior from unaccountable state bureaucrats that are driving many of the state's best businesses out of California. I mean, Jesus Christ, what a thing to say in a moment like this. Blizzard President J. Allen Brack, his email to Blizzard staff wasn't much better. He claims he spent his career fighting against bro culture, but certainly didn't provide any examples to back that up. It's a big claim given that Jay directly managed someone named extensively in the Californian suit, one Alex Afrasiabi, who apparently received little more than a slap on the wrist from Brack despite an alleged long-running pattern of harassing behavior. More pointedly, Brack's note didn't contain one hint of acknowledgement, acceptance, or apology, no doubt in line with Blizzard's strategy of tooling up for the coming lawsuit. Retired Blizzard founder Mike Morhaime and retired luminary Chris Metzen both put out statements of their own, and they did contain apologies. Morhaime said, quote, To the women of Blizzard who experienced any of these things, I am extremely sorry I failed you, end quote. While Metzen said, quote, We failed, and I'm sorry. To all of you at Blizzard, I offer you my deepest apologies for the part I played in a culture that fostered harassment, inequality, and indifference, end quote. Their contrition met a mixed reception, with some appreciating these men taking responsibility for their part in all this, and others commenting that their words meant little since they didn't act when they had the chance. I'll tell you who's not contrite, though. Former Director of Homeland Security under President George W. Bush and Activision Blizzard's current Head of Compliance, Fran Townsend. She sent out an email to staff where she claimed that the suit, quote, presented a distorted and untrue picture of our company, including factually incorrect, old, and out-of-context stories, some from more than a decade ago, end quote. She would go on to tout the suit wasn't describing the Activision that she knew and loved. The problem with that, she joined the company in March as a super senior executive. How the fuck was she gonna have any idea what it's like for the troops on the ground who have been living these stories for the better part of their careers? Even in the context of needing to prepare a legal defense, Townsend's response was a staggeringly tone-deaf overreach in both its intention and its substance. The staff of Blizzard are absolutely not having it. Dozens of Activision Blizzard staff have taken to social media to confirm many of the allegations made in the suit. Quote, I 
stand with the Activision Blizzard victims and believe their stories, tweeted Blizzard UX director Nikki Crenshaw. To claim that these stories are factually incorrect or untrue is a slap in the face to current and former employees and does not represent my core values. In addition to social media statements, a number of Blizzard staff stopped working in solidarity with those who have suffered, with one developer commenting that, quote, almost no work is being done on World of Warcraft right now while this obscenity plays out, end quote. Just today, over 1,000 current and former Blizzard staff signed an open letter calling the company's response to the discrimination lawsuit abhorrent and insulting, which, yeah, sounds about right if you've read any of the official comms coming out of Blizzard. Protests were also to be found in one unlikely location, Oribos City. A group of WoW players have been staging a sit-in at one of WoW's major cities to make clear that players stand behind those affected by Blizzard's alleged toxic culture. Various player communities, forums, and subreddits have all expressed their disgust at the allegations, with many people choosing to boycott Activision Blizzard products until decisive action is taken. Another group applying a boycott is the game's media. In a first, at least as far as I can remember, numerous publications including The Gamer, Prima Games, The Escapist, and Game Explain have said that they will not cover Activision Blizzard titles until meaningful change occurs. Much of the narrative around this has revolved around the idea of Blizzard being in decline. From its glory days when it made the biggest, most ambitious games ever made, through to the Activision Blizzard merger, to the failure of key releases like Diablo 3, the shrinking of WoW's population, the death of StarCraft, Warcraft 3 reforged. Then there was the Blitzchung affair and the sacking of thousands of staff while executives took home literally hundreds of millions of dollars. It's easy to see this as part of the story of Blizzard's decline, but I do think it's important to remember that many of the people named in this suit worked at Blizzard in those golden years, and many of the events that are alleged to have taken place occurred at a time when Blizzard was still one of core gaming's darlings. This is not a story of Blizzard's decline. This is a story about what their culture was like at its peak, and likely still is today, if the postings on social media are to be believed. As if to reinforce the point, believe it or not, this was not the only story of sexual harassment and inequality in the games industry we got this this week. Kotaku published a sprawling investigative piece examining Ubisoft's Singapore studio, which for eight years has been trying to make Skull and Bones, Ubisoft's long-awaited pirate game. Kotaku spoke to 20 current and former staff members and found claims of sexual harassment, racial pay disparity, and bullying by managers. The report claims that at least one staff member suffered repeated unwanted sexual advances from a co-worker, but when she took the matter to HR, they essentially blamed her, citing her body language, and suggested the whole thing might have been a miscommunication based on cultural differences. The report would go on to detail the toxic management and alleged sexual harassment perpetrated by the studio's head, a man named Huis Rikor, who was subject to at least one sexual harassment claim and ruled his studio with an iron fist. An inquiry into his leadership resulted in his removal from the studio, but not to worry, he got a job at Ubisoft's HQ in Paris, which apparently is pretty standard play for those deemed too toxic to be working in a studio. I know that I've devoted a lot of time in this episode to this topic, but frankly, I think the health, safety, and well-being of the people making video games is pretty important to talk about, certainly more important than another Avengers dunk. We don't get to love video games the way we do unless cool people make them, and cool people won't make video games if they get treated like shit or worse. I'll continue to cover this story here on this show and elsewhere. All right, shot chaser. There was some good stuff that happened in the world of video games this week as well, so let's talk about that too. This week, EA held its EA Play webinar, talking about upcoming new releases and updates to existing games. The Sims is getting a thing, or has already gotten a thing? I don't know, I didn't bother clicking on that. There's a new Grid game coming out, Grid Legends. It's a racing game, yes, but it's also meant to have a meaty story behind it. A feature pulled straight from EA's broader sports lineup like FIFA and Madden games, where players follow the story of up-and-comers as they move up their career ladder. Apex Legends is getting a new legend, that's nice. EA announced a new single-player game, Tim Burton-inspired adventure RPG called Lost in Random, which seems to combine third-person exploration, traversal and combat with tabletop dice roll elements. I love the art for this, it looks quite cool. One of the most exciting reveals was for Battlefield Portal. What is this? It's fucking cool, that's what it is. It's essentially a pooling of remastered assets and resources from across the history of Battlefield games, all available in one custom game mode making platform. Six maps will be available at launch, as well as a huge number of weapons, vehicles, and gear. The game mode creation tool allows you to create custom game types, similar to what you can pull off in custom servers, only with a lot more options. This is a really great gift to the Battlefield community, and it's gonna be fantastic to see what they can do with it. EA saved the best for last, the reveal of the totally not secret because everyone knew it was coming, Dead Space Remake. 
I say remake because this is a remake, not a sequel. It's in development at EA Motive, the team who just delivered Star Wars Squadrons, and the entire game is being rebuilt in EA's Frostbite engine. We don't really know anything else about it at this point, except that it won't feature any microtransactions, one of the things that famously ruined the third game. It's bittersweet to see an announcement like this. EA ran this franchise and the studio that made it, Visceral Games, into the ground, and now they get to resurrect its carcass and profit off it while Visceral is still dead and buried. I really hope every form of Visceral staff member landed a cool gig after being treated so badly by EA. FIFA remains the jewel in EA's crown and this week it got some interesting new competition, eFootball. Yes, it is the worst name of all time, but you know what it used to be called? Pro Evolution Soccer or Winning Eleven depending on where you were playing it. That's right, Konami's long-standing and fairly successful football game has a new name, and get this, it's going free to play. Konami announced that they were abandoning their paid release approach to the franchise, saying that eFootball would be a living, evolving platform that will offer up free updates and roster changes on a regular basis. I mean, that makes sense. EA charges full box price for minimal changes to its sporting games each year, and it also resets your progress in the ultimate team loot box collection game mode, keeping you on an endless spending treadmill. There's no such thing as Soccer 2, at least not yet, so paying 70 US dollars each year for a new FIFA game has always been dumb, and it sounds even more dumb now with eFootball. Anyway, eFootball is coming to all platforms, including mobile, at some point in the future, Hopefully the microtransactions aren't going to be too bad. They, they, they probably will be. We got new details on the Steam Deck this week. It was revealed by Valve that the new handheld was targeting 30 FPS and a bunch of people lost their damn mind since the idea that a handheld PC wasn't targeting 60 FPS was so insulting. Pre-order cancelled, etc, etc. Dude, it's a handheld PC. What were you expecting? 4K, 240 FPS, 25 hours of battery life comes bundled with Half-Life 3? Come on now, let's be realistic. Valve would go on to clarify that the targeting 30 FPS thing referred to the performance floor they'd like to protect, but they'd ideally be aiming for games to perform above that, well above that, depending on the game, of course. That sounds fine, and I don't think any reasonable person would have expected anything different. All right, we've got a small tidbit of news in relation to Final Fantasy 16. I make that clear because when you hear the words Final Fantasy these days, it's usually about 14, but no, this is 16 news. Turns out the English voice acting and performance capture is all wrapped up at this point, ahead of the Japanese voice and performance capture, which will be done over the coming weeks. It's an interesting bit of news because it shows where Square is in the development of the game, since a lot of that stuff gets done fairly late in the process. At the same time, we shouldn't be expecting FF16 next week or anything. The fact that we don't have a clear release window yet tells you this probably isn't hitting until early to mid-2022, so we still have a wait ahead of us. While you wait for 16, have you thought about checking out Final Fantasy XIV? Because a lot of other people have. This week, game lead Yoshi P put out a statement apologizing to fans for server congestion and explained that they'd like to build new servers, but they literally can't buy the semiconductors needed even when they try and pay above market price. Yoshi P would go on to apologize for not anticipating the success of the game. And I agree, he should apologize for making the best MMORPG on the market right now. How dare he? God damn it, Yoshi P, get your shit together. So, what got announced or delayed this week? Well, not much. Firstly, upcoming turn-based FPS Lemnus Gate got a delay to September 28th. It was meant to be out next week, so this is a pretty late stage to call a delay. Hope everything's okay with that one. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is getting a new expansion, The Siege of Paris. It's gonna add more Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which is already enough reason for me to tap out. The expansion's release date was leaked this week, August 5th, on all platforms. That's not official, but it's likely. Finally, Aloy is coming to Genshin Impact. The developers tweeted out the reveal this week, and everyone was really happy about this. Not only because it's Aloy and everyone loves her, but because it signals that we can probably expect more crossover content in the future in Genshin. I still have only played a few hours of Genshin. This certainly seems like a good excuse to play at least a few more. Aloy will be out at some point later this year, no date yet. So, what came out last week? Well, one thing I forgot to mention is that Hunt Showdown got a new map, Desal. Everyone is loving it. It's meant to be the best map Crytek have made to this point, and it even has Shrek's house as an Easter egg in it. That's a true story, by the way. Hunt is one of the most tense and atmospheric PvP experiences I've ever had, so much so that I actually made a guide for how to play it, and I hadn't made a guide for years before that. Honestly, Hunt is incredible, you should play it. I'll leave a link to my review and my starter guide below. Chris Tales arrived on a variety of platforms, including Game Pass, mind you, and it got a pretty solid reception, sitting at 75 critic score and 7.8 user score on Metacritic. 
Although it's only at 62% positive on Steam, it's being universally praised for its presentation, soundtrack and voice work, but its gameplay is a little more divisive, not quite clicking with everyone. Biggest release of the week was the Poke MOBA Pokemon Unite. This one is not doing super well with both critics and users, users in particular being very unimpressed. Funniest thing I saw for this was Moist Critical, who just went full pay to win on this and just started buying everything, maxing out all his items before completely dumpstering all the kids who did not have access to their mum's credit card. Thanks, Charlie. That was good viewing. So what's coming out this week? God, there is a lot. Okay, so Flight Sim arrives today on Xbox Series X and S. It's sitting at 92 on Metacritic-ish, uh, so I actually think it's the highest rated game of the year at this point. Uh, it's also on Game Pass. It's gonna be really funny to see how many people will try this out, but then give up before they figure out how to take off, which is exactly what happened to me. Neo The World Ends With You arrives today on the PS4 and Switch. It also got fantastic reviews, seeing an 83 critic score on Metacritic. I love the art style for this. I really wish I had time to play it, but I don't. Samurai Warriors 5 arrives today on basically all platforms. It's meant to be more of the same in a good way, if you like that sort of thing. The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles arrives today for Switch, PS4 and PC. Kind of a bummer that it didn't make it to Xbox. Not sure what happened there. Anyway, reviews are glowing. 87 on Metacritic. It's being celebrated as a brilliant package for fans and newcomers alike. Tribes of Midgard arrives today on PS5, PS4 and PC. It's a Diablo-esque survival game hybrid with a beautiful art style and you can play it with up to nine of your friends. Initial buzz about this is positive. Final reviews will be out this week. I'll be sure to let you know how they land. Chernobyl Light arrives today on the PC and it's out on the 7th of August on consoles. This is a stalker-inspired first-person narrative-led immersive sim RPG. God, that's a lot of buzz words. It's early access period generated some great buzz. I plan to play through this this week actually, so I'll let you know what I think soon. Near Reincarnation arrives on both Android and iOS tomorrow. It's free, so grab it if you're interested. It's near, but it's gacha. So have your wallet ready, I guess. The Forgotten City is hitting every platform but the Switch this week. It's a standalone spin-off of one of the most downloaded Skyrim mods ever made. I actually reviewed this title and that review will go live today at 5.30 p.m. Sydney time. Keep an eye out for it. Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster Volumes 1, 2, and 3 arrive on the 28th for PC and mobile. Would have been nice to see those on console, but okay. And capping off a huge week is The Ascent, which arrives on Xbox and PC on the 29th. I will also have a review for this up later this week. Spoiler alert, I've got good things to say about that one. Put this on your radar. This is The Last Video Store. It's a PSVR exclusive that's about visiting the last video store in the world. Which is basically a blockbuster. You walk around the store and you can pick up videos and look at them. And you can even watch some of them in this weird cinema thing where people look at you and smile and it's kind of awkward. I don't know what the point of this is, but I like it because going to the video store was fucking rad and I miss it. There's no release date for this yet. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised if this game never even comes out, but I hope it does. It looks cool. Sort of free stuff time. Huge week, but like the rest of the episode, we're going to move through it quick because this week is packed. Epic first. You can still grab Defense, Grid, The Awakening, and Verdun until the 29th, but on the 30th, you'll be able to grab the excellent Mother Gunship and the probably very boring, but some people get off in this sort of thing, Train Sim World 2. Twitch Prime is great this week. Right now, you can grab Battlefield 1 and commit August 2nd, you'll be able to grab Battlefield 5. They also gave away Battlefield 4 recently, so that's a lot of Battlefield. Enjoy yourself. Thanks, Uncle Jeff. Spaceman. Did you see his penis rocket? Looked like a penis. Anyway, PS Plus games for the month have leaked. This is still unconfirmed at this point, but they did show up on the official PlayStation website by mistake, so it's a pretty solid source. This month, PS Plus subscribers can expect Plants vs. Zombies, Battle for Neighborville, Tennis World Tour 2, and PlayStation 5 owners can get their hands on the PvEVP Battle Royale game Hunters Arena Legends. The other thing that PS5 owners can get is six months of Apple TV Plus for free if they download the app to their PS5. This unfortunately is not available to PS4 owners. You have to activate it on a PS5, which kind of sucks. There's some good shows on the platform. I haven't watched Ted Lasso yet or Ted Lasso, whatever it is, but I hear good things. Game Pass, Jesus, where to begin this month? Huge. Okay, Battlefield 5, sure. The classic Crimson Skies and Blinks are there. The newly released Flight Sim and Chris Tales and Raji and Last Stop and The Ascent and Lethal League Blaze and Omno and Project Wingman. If I had more word count, I would be telling you that this is one of the best months of Game Pass ever, and I'd be right 
because I always am. That is, except when it comes to this week's feel-good story of the week. Some time ago, Splitgate was released on PC. It's a clever shooter that merges the style and pace of Halo with the portals from Portal. Like, exactly the same mechanic, lifted and dropped here. When the game first released, it went nowhere, immediately plummeting to just a few hundred players a day, max. The game was essentially dead on arrival, and I said as much in a tweet once. I mean, the numbers were pretty clear back then, so I've, I feel like I, I kind of got it right then. But turns out, in the long run, I got it wrong. This week, after launching on consoles and including full crossplay, Splitgate exploded. The game servers couldn't keep up with demand and the developers revealed that they were hard capped at 65,000 concurrent players. So that's a lot more than the two or three hundred-ish players the game was getting a month ago. The game has been so successful that the game's 1.0 official launch has been delayed while the developers tool up and build larger server capacity for their launch. I love to see this stuff. I can't imagine how down and out this team would have felt seeing the numbers so low for so long, but they stuck it out and look at them now. Congrats to the team. I hope the 1.0 launch blows up as well. Blows up in a good way, you know what I mean. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the week in video games. As always, I appreciate you spending 20 minutes of your week with me. And if you enjoyed yourself, then please hit the like button, subscribe, ding the notification bell, and leave a comment below with your favorite flavor of Dorito. Mine's Mountain Dew. That's a real thing. Look it up. Thanks again. I'll see you next week. Let's say, hypothetically, you had to go outside. Now, I know that won't happen because we are gamers and that's not what we do. But let's say, hypothetically, you did have to go outside. Wouldn't you want to have some music in your ears while you were doing that? Or a podcast? Or maybe listen to the latest Shill Up video? Probably not on that last one, but definitely the podcast or the music thing. Enter Raycon wireless earbuds. I've been using Raycons for more than two years now and I was skeptical about them at first because they're literally half the price of other earbuds and I was like, no, they must be terrible, but they're not. The quality was just as good or better than other earbuds I'd used and the battery life was awesome as well. Raycon's new everyday earbuds are their best model yet. With six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise isolating fit. Now look, I was joking about that whole gamer thing. We go outside, we have jobs to get to, we have friends to visit, we go to the gym sometimes. Point is, whatever you do, you can have your Raycons in your pocket. I don't leave home without them at this point, and once you get your hands on a pair, I suspect you won't either. Best of all, Raycons come with a 45-day return policy, so you don't have to take my word for it. You can try them for yourself, and if you aren't happy, you get your money back. Easy. To get 15% off your order, click the link in the description below, or visit buyraycon.com forward slash skill up. Thanks Raycon for sponsoring the video, and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.